I am pleased to present today a brief webinar on highly fluorinated chemicals. I will refer to them today by their shorter name, fluorochemicals. I would like to first point out that there are many classes of fluorochemicals used today in commerce and more are likely to come on the market in the near future. Most of the fluorochemicals in commerce have received very little attention from scientists, so we have very little data on them. However, some have been the focus of intense scientific research for up to 20 years by researchers around the globe. Today, we'll highlight two classes of important fluorochemicals, the perfluorinated sulfonates and the perfluorinated carboxylates. Classes of fluorochemicals are much like families with members who share certain family traits or features, and much of the information I present today is derived from research conducted on these two individual classes of fluorochemicals and specific fluorochemicals that you may have heard of, and that's PFOS and PFOA. And these two only come from two of the many classes of fluorochemicals that are in commerce today. On slide six, I would like to introduce PFOS and PFOA and their families. The molecules of PFOS and PFOA are shown at the bottom of this slide. PFOS and PFOA both contain atoms found in nature, including fluorine, shown as the letter F, carbon, shown as the letter C, oxygen as the letter O, and PFOS has one sulfur atom marked with an S. PFOS and PFOA share a common family trait, a highly fluorinated carbon backbone that is comprised of carbon atoms that are bonded to each other and to many fluorine atoms. The bonds are indicated by the connecting lines between the letters. PFOS is a family member of the perfluorinated sulfonates class of fluorochemicals. PFOS and PFOA are cousins who are related to each other through the family trait of having highly fluorinated backbones. Within the class or family of sulfonates, PFOS and its shorter chain family members, going down all the way to C4 and lower, and longer up to C10 uh, carbon uh, in the chain, are the fluorinated backbone that the family members share, and they have also have the trait of having a sulfonate functional group attached to this fluorinated carbon backbone. PFOA on the right is just one member of the perfluorinated carboxylate class or family, where the carboxylate part of the molecule is made up of one carbon and two oxygen atoms, which are attached to the fluorinated backbone. What's unique about the carbon-fluorine bonds of both PFOS and PFOA and their family members is that they're short and strong and made up of tightly shared electrons. The bonds are the glue that hold these molecules together. And this tight internal connection of the bonds that make up fluorinated backbones give these molecules their characteristic ability to repel other molecules such as oil and water. And it's this same family characteristic that makes PFOS and PFOA and their other highly fluorinated family members resistant to breakdown in organisms, which includes people all the way up to polar bears, and in the environment. On slide 7, recall that PFOS and PFOA are molecules that are assembled from atoms found in nature, but they are assembled in a way that is not found in nature. We know this because highly fluorinated tails on other molecules are not found in nature. So when we see molecules like PFOS and PFOA and their closely, remembered, uh, closely related family members in human blood and in polar bears and in remote ocean water, we know that they are there because these highly fluorinated chemicals were manufactured, applied to consumer goods and surfaces, and that we humans are in close contact with those treated goods over our lifetimes and over the lifetimes of the articles. And that these chemicals then are uh, move and transport around the globe as a result of human use. And as uh, we have um, maintained uh, garments, for example, by washing and ultimately disposing of uh, materials that are treated with these fluorochemicals and disposing of these treated uh, consumer goods, these fluorochemical residues uh, end up in very remote locations of the globe through the movement of air and water. And PFOS and PFOA and their highly fluorinated C8 backbones are of particular interest because they're two of the most intensely studied fluorochemicals and in part because there's an increasing number of reports that link exposure of PFOS and uh, PFOA to an array of human health problems. These two family members have been in commerce for decades and even though PFOS manufacture has been phased out in the U.S., it occurs elsewhere in the world and is still available for use in the markets. When compared to PFOS and PFOA, we know relatively less about the other fluorochemicals, 
even some of their more closely related family members that have shorter or longer chain back months, simply because we haven't had our attention on these forms for as long as we have on PFOS and PFOAS. We can see, for example, the shorter chain family members of PFOS and PFOA occurring in landfill leachates. And landfills act like time capsules. And many of our fluorochemical treated consumer goods end up in landfills. And many of these cells that we can see now today have been closed for decades. So we know that these, many of these uh, various carbon chain linked materials have been in commerce for a long time. And from this information, we know many of the family members and cousins of PFOS and PFOA um, are therefore quite persistent. The issue we face is that many of the family members and highly fluorinated uh, family members of PFOS and PFOA, uh, we simply haven't had the opportunity yet to build the equivalent body of knowledge or understanding about their potential for human health effects or for wildlife. On slide eight, you can see the types of consumer articles where fluorochemicals are applied for their oil and water repellency characteristics which are family characteristics of these chemicals. Carpeting and upholstery in homes, offices, automobiles, schools, along with their apparel, both outdoor wear and everyday wear, floor waxes, paper and food packaging, nonstick cookware, uh, paints, and even some types of dental floss contain one or more of these families of fluorochemicals. These are just some of the well-known examples of where these chemicals occur in commerce. On slide nine, we now recognize that many treated consumer articles are in the marketplace. We also know from data collected around the world that some of the highest concentrations of fluorochemicals are actually associated with our indoor environments. For example, fluorochemicals are detected in the air or the gas phase of homes and offices because these volatile forms migrate uh, from the consumer products to which they were applied um, over the lifetime of the products in the home and office environment. When we open the doors to our homes and offices, we actually vent our buildings to the outside, and the higher indoor air concentrations are actually sets up a gradient where the fluorochemicals flow from indoors to outdoors. So fluorochemicals outdoors uh, actually may originate in part from what we use indoors. We also know that fluorochemicals have historically entered the environment from locations where the fluorochemicals were manufactured or where they were specifically applied to consumer products. Fluorochemical residues are also released during the washing of apparel or the maintenance of surfaces in our homes and office environments, the daily sites of human activity. In many cases, fluorochemical residues go to wastewater treatment plants, and now a number of studies show the same result. Wastewater treatment plants do not effectively remove PFOS and PFOA or their closely related family members. It's important to note that wastewater treatment plants were never designed for the re removal of trace levels of organic contaminants. At the end of their lifetime, treated uh, consumer products go to rest in landfills in countries like the U.S. where space permits. In the case of newer landfills that have engineered linings, liquid waste, also known as leachate, is collected and transferred largely to wastewater treatment plants, which we now know are not effective in removing many of these highly fluorinated chemicals. Older landfills that are not lined potentially leak into the subsurface, which then has the potential to impact groundwater. On slide 10, we have a cartoon that captures how scientists think about how fluorochemicals are released to the environment and how they might contribute to human and environmental exposures. If you look at the upper left-hand corner of the slide, you can see that the manufacturing sites and sites where chemicals were applied to materials are potential sources of fluorochemicals to the environment through direct uh, emissions. If you follow the arrows on the left side of the slide, Sites of manufacturing or application are point sources that then have the potential to release residues to uh, landfills and ultimately to wastewater treatment plants. And then in turn, wastewater treatment plants and landfills may also have releases to air, soil, and water. At the bottom of the slide, you can follow the arrows from contaminated soil or water that can lead to residues in crops, fish, and livestock, which are connected to the human food supply. In the center of the slide, you can follow the flow of treated articles in commerce, for example, upholstered items and fabrics. At the end of life, these materials are sent to landfills where, as mentioned, residues can end up in the environment or basically are sent to that wastewater treatment plant, which are not effective in their removal. The biosolids, also known as sludges, generated by wastewater treatment plants are land applied in many locations around the country. 
Back up the top of the slide, treated consumer products are the potential sources of fluorochemical residues that end up in our air and dust, which are inhalation or ingestion routes for human exposure. In the case of children, dust can be a disproportionate source of fluorochemicals as well as other contaminants. Another important exposure pathway uh, tucked up in the right corner of the slide is the human-to-human -human transfer. Fluorochemicals are documented as transferring from mother to infant during breastfeeding and in utero from mother to fetus via cord blood. So many of the exposure pathways on this slide derive from our knowledge of PFOS and PFOA through scientific investigation. We know much less about the other family members and cousins of PFOS and PFOA. However, we do know from recent work that cord blood disproportionately transfers the shorter chain forms of some fluorochemicals from mother to fetus. On slide 11, we shift our focus away from human exposure into the outdoor environment. Today, we find fluorochemical residues in lakes, rivers, and oceans, even in very remote locations around the globe. Various studies conducted around the world indicate that fluorochemicals are found in air and precipitation, including rain and snow, both in urban areas where people live and work, but also in remote locations with few people. Wildlife in both marine and land-based food chains exhibit fluorochemical residues at all levels. For example, data for polar bears in Arctic ecosystems indicates that this top-of-the-food chain predator contains high levels of fluorochemical residues. The link between human use of fluorochemicals and their presence in polar bears is now established. Over 10 years ago, Dr. Craig Criddle of Stanford stood before his audience in a white crisp shirt and a brilliant yellow tie that was very stain resistant and remarked that he did not recall ever being asked if he was willing to trade the stain repellency of his yellow tie for the survival of the polar bears. Slide 12. The knowledge base on the human toxicology of fluorochemicals is rapidly growing. However, what we know today about the toxicity of fluorochemicals is largely based on studies that focus on PFOS and PFOA. We now know that PFOS and PFOA residues persist in the human body for years, and an increasing number of studies involves large numbers of people that report links between human exposure to PFOA and kidney cancer, prostate, ovarian, and testicular cancer, as well as thyroid disease. A smaller number of studies with fewer human subjects indicates links to delayed puberty, and in women, decreased fertility and early menopause, and reduced testosterone levels in men. In addition, children who have received childhood immunizations exhibit reduced immune responses, and the diminished immunity is related to their blood concentrations of certain fluorochemicals. Relationships be between PFOA and elevated cholesterol also have been identified. On slide 13, I'd like to turn your attention to PFOS and PFOA replacements. Chemical alternatives to PFOS and PFOA most likely vary by manufacturer, and their structures are only just beginning to be revealed and in some cases are unknown and most are considered as proprietary information. Alternatives may be fluorochemicals with water chain, uh, shorter fluorinated backbones. Some may be family members of PFOS and PFOA or close cousins, so it's important to understand if they possess a highly fluorinated chain or not. Some of the shorter chain fluorochemicals are also now found in uh, surface water, groundwater, wastewater, and seawater. And while some of the shorter chain alternatives are not considered biocumulative, they share the family trait of PFOS and PFOA of being very persistent in the environment. PFOS and PFOA have no known degradation pathways in the environment that occur naturally under ambient conditions, and so what does it mean to be persistent? To understand what it means for a chemical to have no known degradation pathways in the environment is Im imagining the world where the world is a bathtub where someone is turned on the faucet, but the tub has no drain. So eventually these concentrations build up if there's no way to reduce them. Identifying alternatives is challenging because from to PFOS and toxicology data by comparison with which to make decisions. Recent work by scientists in Canada and Germany find select C7 and C6 fluorochemicals in human blood, and in addition, we see that shorter flora chain, uh, shorter chain fluorochemicals have the potential to cause changes in cells associated with tumors. On slide 14, I have some take-home points. 
Once produced, persistent forms of fluorochemicals stay on the planet for a very, very long time. And the widespread contamination we see today in food, water, and soil is due to human use of these materials and the global distribution of fluorochemical residues by processes that may include air and water circulation. Our current understanding of the toxicology of these fluorochemicals is developed based on our knowledge primarily of PFOS and PFOA. In comparison to PFOS and PFOA, we know relatively less about other uh, proposed alternatives, in part because their structures may not be known, because we may not have had the opportunity to study them, and simply they've received little attention to date. The last point on this page is that while it may seem to be a quick fix to shift from, to various alternatives, many times scientists simply don't have sufficient data to show that they are safer alternatives. On slide 15, the question we ask is, what can we do to re reduce the potential for harm? The first thing to do is to ask yourself, do we need these chemicals for all the performance protection applications in which they're currently used? We need to rethink whether all apparel needs this type of treatment or this type of oil and water repellency function. Does all carpeting and all food packaging where it's currently being used need that function? And the second point, and the place where we can shift our attention, is to support research to find safer alternatives. There's at least two possibilities, maybe more. One could be through the innovation of materials to re-engineer surfaces and perhaps take a page from nature using processes or concepts such as biomimicry. Um, if we look at the potential for creating three-dimensional surfaces, it might provide important insights to use molecules and atoms that are assembled by nature to perform the functions we desire. And as mentioned in earlier part of this series, to look toward green chemistry as a way to perhaps provide a greener chemical solution to offer the same sort of performance and protection currently offered by fluorochemicals. And on page 16 is the last page where we leave you with a few follow-up questions. As you move about your business life and your daily life, please consider the following questions. Are there fluorochemicals in the products you manufacture or sell or even use? What function do they serve and is this function critical? And have alternatives been investigated? And finally, would you be interested in continuing this discussion? And with that, I would like to close this lecture. Thank you very much.